Oh, we about to get it. What up, what up, it's Girl K. Dot, and today we are going to cover the greatest book that has ever been written in the history of humankind, now and forevermore. That's a personal opinion, but that's also an objective fact. We're talking about Don Quixote. Here's the thing though, Don Quixote collectively is about 50 chapters long, and I mean 50 long, detailed, extensively long chapters. So in the description below I have some links for whoever is unfortunate enough, I mean lucky enough, to read all 52 chapters probably in one setting, maybe two days, for class or test or some other thing. Don Quixote was written by Miguel de Cervantes, one of the most badass people of all time. He was born in the 16th century and his father was a doctor, but back then doctors made squat. So he was pretty poor and he moved around a lot. Uh, when he turned up, I think about 21 or some, some age, he uh, joined the Spanish army and started fighting in battles. In one of the battles, the Battle of Lepanto, he got shot three times. Two in the chest, one in the arm. He wasn't even supposed to be out there. He was sick and he told the commander that if he didn't fight, he felt like he was betraying God and his country. And so they let him out there and he got shot three times. One of them was in his arm and he lost the ability to use that arm. So after that, people started calling him El Manco de Lepanto, which is the most badass nickname I've ever heard in my life. Then after serving in the war, he got captured and was enslaved like three times. Like he got captured escape got captured escape got captured got ransoms who is this person we what what the man the myth the legend this isn't even the book let me get to the book i probably should do that let me calm down so in 1605 he publishes don quixote which is the first part it's about 25 chapters and people go bat shit crazy miguel de Cervantes was about to call it quits but this other anonymous source published a part two and this anonymous dude had no affiliation with miguel de Cervantes, and he you know took the character and all the whole storyline basically and tried to continue it tried to make up you know a, a continuation of that story Cervantes got pretty pissed he got hella pissed he got so pissed that he put a rush order on another second version that he himself authored and published that in 1615 and in that he put a little pre-story where it's him talking about it he writes about this anonymous source and calls him like this nitwit ripoff like doesn't even know anything about the storyline a fake a phony he's He's pretty angry. And then that same year, he dies. Oh, I'm pretty sure he got so stressed out about this guy that he like made himself die an early death from the stress. So moral of the story is don't stress about things because it's gonna kill you. Let's get into the actual story because we haven't started the actual story yet. Open up the book and we meet this man named Alonso Quijano, except we're not 100% sure that's his actual name. The narrator doesn't actually share what his name is. It could be Quijada, it could be Quijana, it could be Quijada, like we, we don't even know. In fact, we don't even know where this guy lives because the narrator just tells us somewhere in La Mancha, which is like not helpful at all. What we are sure of is that this guy is old. He's not your typical protagonist who's like a 20 young something coming into this world. No, he's like 50 and he's pushing 50 in the 16th century. So that's like probably 107 in, in modern day years. And he's this old scraggly, super tall, super twiny dude. You, if you saw him in the street, you would think that the lightest breeze would topple him over. Also, this guy spends all his time reading books and not just any books, but specific kinds of books. Those romantic novels with the hero, the knight in shining armor, the damsel in distress, and he spends day in and day out reading these books. The narrator straight up from the beginning says that this guy's brain is compared to those shrivel up raisins that nobody eats in the trail mix. So he's just lost it. He's lost it to a point that not only does he read the books all the time but he's starting to believe that they are real and he's starting to believe that he himself is a knight in shining armor so he decides that he's going to 
fully embody his role as the knight in shining armor and go out into the world and basically just reenact all the stories that he's been told. And since this book is 52 chapters and probably a thousand plus pages, I'm going to tell you three main stories that I think are the most important to understanding the novel. The first story is how he gets ready to go out into the world. He pulls out his great grandfather or maybe his grandfather's armor from when the knight in shining armor was an actual thing and it's this old rusted has like green oxidation all over it and he kind of twines it together with string. He tries to test how durable it is and so he runs it with this lance um, that he's also picked up from his grandfather's stash and the thing just crumbles apart. So he ties it up again with more string and so maybe some duct tape or whatever the equivalent to duct tape was in the 16th century and this time he doesn't even try it. So you can see how desperate he is for this ideal and this storyline to work that he can't test it anymore because if he sees it falling apart he himself is gonna start falling apart every knight needs three things a cool ass name a cool ass horse with a cool ass name and a cool ass maiden with a cool ass name so he has to put all these things together so he basically takes his name and forms it to don quixote de la mancha which is a boss ass name imagine you're in class on the first day of school and the teachers call and roll and they come down to your name and they're like don 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 and you're like it's don quixote de la mancha like get it right please but if you think about it and this is you know originally written in spanish today la mancha is a place la mancha is a place in spain but la mancha also means stain so he's really saying don quixote of the stained one of the marked one that he's somehow defective then he has to get to his horse he has a horse Here's the problem, his horse is not a noble steed, but a workhorse. And he's not only a workhorse, he's an old ass workhorse. And his horse is an interesting character to trace throughout the book because his horse is just done. Like he does not, he has been dealing with this man all of his life. And he just doesn't want to play these games anymore. Don Quixote gives his horse the name Rocinante. Also, badass name. But when you break it down, Rosin is a workhorse and Ante means before. So what he's really saying is that before all this nonsense, this horse was legit just a workhorse. I love these names. So finally, he needs a lady in waiting to dedicate all his victories to because that's what knights do back then. And he knew he knows this woman in town whose name is Aldonza Lorenzo. And that sounds like a nice name, but back then it was the equivalent of something like Bertha. And she's a fish packer. So she probably smells like fish 24 seven. I'm not gonna judge, but I'm just letting you know what is going down. Don Guillote sees Aldonza Lorenzo as this princess but he knows that she's gonna need a better name because when he's calivorting through the forest and he's telling everyone he's fighting for his woman and they say well what is your woman's name he can't belt out Aldonza Lorenzo like that's not gonna work so instead he gives her the name Dulcinea de Toboso. Dulce means sweet I mean like let's just like Keep it 100% what this guy is doing. Another thing, we never meet Aldonza or Dulcinea, now that her name is that. We never see her. And that's just another thing that we're just going to add to the fantasy. This guy starts fighting all these battles to protect the honor of a woman we never see. Cervantes is making this point that the female characters of these old romance novels don't act as characters, but as like these symbols of, you know, chastity and virtue which has been forced upon the women of the time not to act as people but to embody those same virtues of chastity and goodness the second story happens a little later in the book um and don quixote has met this man named sancho panza and don quixote realizes that he needs like a sidekick because all the knights in the old romance text have this sidekick who accompanies them and all these other things so he convinces sancho panza to join him as his sidekick. Now you're probably thinking, why the hell is Sancho Panza following a crazed man 
into the forest like would you do that Sancho Panza would because he realizes or he's been promised an island and so Sancho Panza who's the opposite of Don Quixote he's a short you know fat little man he has he rides on a little donkey um it's the best thing to see them together in in pictures because it's just so hilarious but Sancho Panza sees a financial benefit from this this whole fiasco and so he follows Don Quixote through his adventures. This story is one of their first adventures together. Don Quixote comes into this field and he sees these giant ass windmills off in the distance um, and he turns to Sancho Panza and he says look there are the giants that we have to slay and Sancho Panza looks and he says those are windmills. And Don Quixote says, no, those are giants. And Sancho Panza says, no, no, they're windmills. And so he says, I'm going to go attack the giants. And Sancho Panza says, sir, I really don't think you should do that because they are windmills and not giants. And Don Quixote says, you know what? I'm just going to leave you right here. You're obviously a scared cat. And he charges towards these windmills thinking that they are giants. And he has his lance, you know, pointed at the windmills. Obviously, you know, because of physics, he just bounces right off. The windmill knocks him off his horse, knocks his sword out of his hand, and he hits the ground hard. And Sancho Panza comes up behind him and says, sir, do you see now that they're windmills? Because... They're not giants. And Don Quixote takes one look at the whole situation and immediately comes up with a new story. He says, clearly a wizard is involved who has enchanted these giants to look and act and feel and physically follow the rules of physics like windmills. And in this scene, we really see just, just how far this guy is willing to go. And that whole idea of these two, you know, continues on and on and on. They go on more and more adventures and their adventures are incredibly incredibly funny but they also have this darker point um, there's usually you know some sort of victim who is based on the actions of Don Quixote and Sancho Panza he, his life or her life are actually physically changed um, by this man who's trying to live this fantasy of valor and knights and and honor and and all these other things and, and so it's it's a symbolism of changing times because Spain is going through the same kind of changing times. Their glory days are ending and people are starting to realize, especially Cervantes, how the hierarchy system they've established is crap. It's, I'm just gonna keep it like that. The last story is the final story in the book. Don Quixote and Sancho Panza have gone through 51 chapters of adventures and at the end, Don Quixote gets really, really sick. And Sancho Panza brings him back and the, he's in bed. He goes in and out of fever, in and out of consciousness. His niece, his neighbors, his housekeeper are all around him praying that he gets better. And at one point he is conscious. And everyone says, okay, you're gonna get better now that you're conscious, that you're, that you're breathing because that's important. And he says, what have I done? None of it is real. I'm not a knight. And uh, Dulcinea de Polo Toboso is a fish worker. And my horse is clearly an old ass horse. And Sancho Panza, you're not my sidekick. And I'm not a knight. He says, go get the pastor. Go get my lawyer man. And they realize that he's just, his body is giving up just as he is giving up his fantasy. And so he tells the pastor all his confessions. He talks to his lawyer to set up all of his uh, remaining finances. He tells his niece that he, she can get everything that he owns as long as she never marries a man who reads these kinds of books which is just incredible he, he realizes what the literature was able to do to him and he doesn't want the same thing to happen ever again he's preparing to die his family and his neighbors realizing that he is giving up they're trying in the whole previous books they tried to get him to give up the, uh, the fantasy but now they realize it was the only thing keeping him alive and so they're trying to convince him to go back to the fantasy they're saying no but there's more dragons to slay more giants to slay more wizards to capture more ladies lives to honors to protect and he's like no it's not real and they're saying yes but it could be real if you just believe it's real and he says no that's not how it works and it's just, it's just okay okay i'm gonna make it i'm gonna make it out of this it's the old dying to the new it's the death of an entire 
way of thinking in this man. Then he dies. I'm okay. I'm okay. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed. There's so many stories that are important in this, uh, but I like to keep my videos under 20 minutes, so see you around. Deuces.